Thanks very much for coming along to the Sign Hub today. Uh, my name is James Matthews Paul. I am the editor in chief of Output Magazine. Um, where if you don't know Output, we're a large online publication covering uh, print, design, display, emerging technologies, and industrial. Um, and today's Tech Time is going to look at emerging technologies and how they are affecting companies in the sign and display space. Um, I'd like to introduce you to my panel, um, fantastic industry colleagues of mine who I've known for a long time, who are experts in this area. Um, on my right here we have Juan Diaz Diaz, who as well as one of the best known technology journalists in our sector and further afield, he's also the marketing communications manager for Circular Devices, um, which is a company that's working on a new modular smartphone. Um, Sonia Angerer is the editor of Large Format in Germany. So she has a great perspective looking at sign and display, not only from the print angle, but from the traditional angle. And she also writes a lot about digital signage and emerging technology. And Sebastian Hansens is the vice president of marketing and communications at Caldera who most of you will know as a RIP software company for wide format printing. Um, now, Caldera is also the only company on the software side in print that also links into digital signage. And they have a unique um, digital signage product that I'm sure we'll talk about as well. So thank you all for coming to talk to us today. Um, now, we're, this is obviously quite a broad field, talking about the uh, technologies that have been disrupting um, the sign and display space. But first of all, I just wonder if you could just introduce yourselves and tell us what you see going on and what you see as the changes in sign and display. So, Sebastian, do you want to start us off? Okay, hello, everyone. So, we're seeing a lot of mixing of technologies and using all the new applications from print to digital, seeing a lot of new media coming out and learning how to mix what's coming out of a printer with what's inside a monitor. And I think that's very interesting and it's starting to merge and we're starting to educate creatives to go to new markets and educate them about how to make things. What's interesting when you visit a FESPA, if you're an advertiser and this is my background, is seeing how things are made, not just the concept that you need a nice advertisement with girls in bikinis or or gladly textiled men. It's all about how you make things, how it looks, where it's going to be used, how your message is going to come across differently in a more unique fashion. And that's what we're going to talk about, the different messages coming out and how, we're going to, how the new technologies are going to help advertising, branding, and marketing, and where it should go. That's brilliant. It's a very good point. It is all becoming a mixture, isn't it? Sonia, what, what do you see from your perspective? Well, from our perspective, we're uh, covering pretty much of the printing and out outdoor advertising in industry in Germany. Uh, what we see that uh, despite a lot of printers call themselves digital, they are still very analog. They are printing digital, obviously, but they have not embraced any kind of cross-media or uh, mobile advertising as of yet, but they would be in a um, really good position to do so because obviously with outdoor advertising you can tar target the broadest market that is possible, which means like everyone who's out on the streets. Um, so you could be like the very first entry um, um, point for people um, to engage in, in a mobile way with things they don't know yet. Um, but as of now, we don't see that happening um, from the printing houses because they just don't have the um, knowledge that is necessary. They're constant, even if, um, if they um, see themselves as cutting edge digital printing um, companies, they have not yet embraced what digital really means. At least that what we see in Germany, it might be different in other countries. I think that's a very good point, is that there are so many new technologies now. It's very hard for a traditional sign maker to understand which direction they should go. Should they be buying a printer? Should they be getting into digital signage? Uh, how concerned do they need to be about emerging technology? Juan, you cover all of these spaces. What do you see? Well, for me, uh, my point of view is that uh, we are technological mature. I mean, it's not a, it's not an issue, it's not a matter of technology. The real issue is to scale up and down this technology to be usable beyond the industrial markets, the industrial applications where they are there is already applied. I 
moving this on a, on a transversal way that covers what we are doing now and we want to do but not don't how to do it yet is the real challenge. The real challenge is not in the technology, in the machines or in the devices. On the, devices. the real challenge is in the people. People need to learn how to use it. And most of the times, it means a complete change on the way you are doing things. So this issue with content is actually probably one of the key ones. And let's start, we're going to go sort of from now further into the future. So really, over the last five years, what's dominated change in terms of how we sign, use sign and display and how we deploy it is indeed about content, isn't it? And, um, and so about over the last seven years that I've been working in this sector, people were saying, OK, digital screens are going to replace all of the displays that we have. Now, obviously, that's not happened for a number of reasons. And I think that um, one, the two main reasons are learning um, and about the creation of content. So, Sebastian, I wonder, where do you see digital signage? You know, we've, we've obviously got um, signs that give us static information about something. And then we've got uh, signs that give us more dynamic information where the content needs to change. Where do you see um, digital signage now growing in the sign and display area? And why do you think it hasn't maybe moved as fast as we all expected? Well, as you're saying, James, it's all about content and what you want to what you want to say. And the objective of signage is to get a message across. If we look at digital signage, it's many messages changing all the time, which you can't do with a sign. But you can do that with a monitor. If you look at some of the markets that are emerging and where we see sign traditional signage being changed, fast foods because they're changing the pictures of the hamburgers, but also because you want a hamburger to look good and make you hungry when you go there. So again, it's the content trying to change maybe our behavior or change the way we're looking at things. So those emerging markets where you see digital signage is the technology is up to scale now. It's easy to get a TV. It's easy to get a player. And now you have a lot of websites like iStock, Photolio that have videos. It makes it accessible to people who are looking for the content. And now they have this objective to show content changing all the time just because also we're in a sustainable market so you don't want to be changing and wasting the signs and throwing them in the garbage. So traditional signs being printed has one objective, decoration, a message, and digital signage has another objective which is fast moving, fast changing signage. And so these two really coexist and a good example is if you go to the digital signage shows, you see print all over the place. And here we're at FESPA talking to printers who are always scared of digital signage, which makes no sense. And then it depends on the way you look at digital signage, because if you look at a digital sign well integrated into a print project, it looks really nice, it's really slick, it's very keen. And if you put just a TV in front of a sign, it's a black frame with different content, which is rather boring. So now it's about educating all the people that are in our market, our traditional market that are printers, to go to digital signage as an add-on, as cherry on the sundae or cherry on the cake. It's just different. That is a really good point because, I mean, Sonia, we know that sign and display producers, they have the right sales channel, don't they, to sell digital signage to their existing customers. So, you know, what can we do to encourage them to embrace this new technology and to help their customers see it? Well, I see. Um, um, I think you can. You need to make a difference. There are really small um, sign shops, and basically, what they need is what is already in existence, which means like a really easier media player you can put onto a, um, like a, a digital signage or even a TV set. They can pe sell to their local shops. It's easy. You can download like. Um, um, videos from Fotolia to show something, uh, or you could even use print um, ads and make a PDF out of it and show it um, on, on that kind of signs. But is that really digital signage and is this really doing um, the right thing for the technology? I think I doubt about it. Um, when it becomes more complicated, because in, like in bigger shops you could also combine digital signage with the inventory, for example, or even uh, with a real-time update on how things are sold at this very moment. Um, so you could make, uh, for example, if you know you have uh, very many apples left, you could um, 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 like play advertising for apples um, at that very moment in the shop. And I don't think that a traditional sign 
printing houses can do something like that because this, uh, in my opinion right now, is more something that a system integrator would be able to do. Um, so maybe they need to partner with a system integrator instead of becoming one themselves. Um, or you have to just expand your company and buy a system integrator. But the really interesting digital signage stuff, I think, is still too complicated for small printing shops. They so might be a really good opportunity for bigger um, printing shops. Um, and I would like to point out um, another thing, if we go ba um, um, away from that, completely commercial, um, um, com commercial side of digital signage. We have seen quite a lot of very nice applications in the museum and arts um, um, sector where people who actually make the realization of, um, um, of a new exhibition, which are very often printing or sign making houses. Um, they also included various parts in um, of actually well, let's call it informational digital signage, but that's not really advertorial, but more content about history, about arts. And these are the things where digital signage, in my opinion, is just gorgeous. I think you're right. It's that, it's that opportunity to engage with people and provide them more relevant information more quickly. That is that, um, and we, I think um, you, what, you've raised a really important point there, Sonia, is that we have a tendency in this industry to talk about sign and display producers. But actually, we could be talking about someone who is a specialist in gold leaf sign painting all the way up to some enormous kind of multinational company, you know, sort of one of the national sign companies or a franchise where they have a large range of equipment and a lot of resources. So we're talking at two different ends of the scale. Um, but I think one thing you raised there, especially, especially in museums and heritage and actually in public information, so we have sign makers who are used to working with metal for example, uh, working with plastics, um, so casings and the holding uh, and, the, and the trays and the lighting and everything, they understand all of that, but that's a very different thing from the content. So Juan, do you think it's important now that people shift from just being, um, you know, we've talked about manual to analog, do you think that um, IT and marketing are coming together and that that's maybe changing the way that we use technology to communicate? I will first answer to your question and then to something you're pointing in. Yeah, sure. Is that way? Big data, I mean, big data is some kind of magic word, but the integration between data and what you do with the data, how you process the data in a meaningful way for business is key for sure. And then you can apply this on digital signage, on uh, regular signage, anything printed or any other way of communicate and doing marketing. And now, as well, you, um, there are two ways for print of things to remain meaningful and useful and make sense. One is being useful, and this is a matter of design. If you design anything printed to be useful beyond its printed cycle life, be it reused, not just recycle it first reuse, then recycle it. That will be big sense for anything because you will use for your uh, primary application, which is the, in this case, a printer sign. And then you will use this for another secondary or tertiary use. And the third, and I'm not joking, this, I'm not kidding about this, it's serious. Make it edible. If you, can, if you can make it cool and you can make it tasty and you can make it healthy, that will be a huge improvement for anything printed. And you cannot do this with digital. And it's not a, it's, I'm not joking about this. Edible is the future, is the ultimate recycling solution. Make something that you can eat. And it's already done. I have seen, I have seen construction material like this make from breath and printed on top. It's done, it's already there. Uh, not particularly tasty, by the way, but they are improving that part. Sebastian, what do you think about edible signage? I think that it's a, it's a good idea. Now you can walk around the show and you can see 3D printing. 3D printing is the same technology that we're talking about. 
as inkjet, and now they're starting to 3D print cakes for bakers. So you're going to have your name on the cake, and you're going to have a 3D print head with something that's edible. So you're now into signage that could be edible. I agree with you. This is not reusing. This is primary using. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm talking about eating this sign for a snack. <laughs> well, I'm not sure if I would really like to eat a sign for a snack, but um, I mean, uh, maybe we could start to make animal food out of it. As long as people um, um, uh, want to eat meat, they, they, we will have to feed the animals or want to drink milk. Um, so, of course, uh, it, it will be a good idea to make signage more sustainable because right now you have the idea that, I mean, once this uh, hall is cleared up again, um, you have like a huge amount of um, leftovers that basically, I don't know, in Germany I don't think they go to landfill, but they're not properly recycled to do something really useful instead of like maybe heating some houses anyway. So, and of course, with everyone engaging more and more in sustainable products, um, I guess signs are um, um, no different there. Uh, I think we also have to think about um, digital signage also being more sustainable because, well, we don't cut down trees in the first place, but we uh, rob a lot of precious metal from the earth, I heard, uh, building those things. So we can't build them to last only two to three years. We need to last them, I don't know, 10 years maybe. Um, I think this is something that has to be kept in mind also. Also the power consumption. When you have your printed sign, basically once you have printed it, it doesn't have very much power consumption. And we need to aim with digital signage to also have rather low power consumption because otherwise it will never become re really sustainable as long as we need, let's say, fossil fuels um, to make um, um, electricity then. I had a question about sustainability, the ecological side of it anyways, because is it a market fad? Because it used to be all the magazines four years ago, everybody talked about ecology. And we used software companies like us and the others, we were creating new tools to measure this carbon output of machines, of media. And today it seems it all disappeared. So my question is, is it the magazines and the press and the thought leaders saying this was what we should have talked about, or is it today that everybody is already sustainable and that's why we don't see it anymore? Um, I'm pretty sure that we're not all sustainable today because um, um, I just thought about, for example, about my next mobile phone. I've bought my last one about, I think, nine months ago, so even the thought is not very sustainable. And my colleague even bought uh, like a new TV set, for example, just recently, and his old one was only two years old. So um, I'm pretty sure that we all need to become much more sustainable. And this also goes for the sign industry. But I think we have to think about narratives, really. Um, you start at some point, and it takes a longer time than you would think of for people to really embrace the thought of um, uh, a more sustainable future. Because, I mean, the, the sustainable future, using making products more sustainable, it actually started in the late 60s. You know, and we're 50 years later now. Now there is another wave when people think about sustainable signage. Um, but the idea, it has been around for 50 years now. It takes some time. There's some. Yeah. Well, uh, sustainability is not just a seal you buy. You need to be part of, and you need to be. Uh, as close to the circular economy model as you can if you want to be susta really sustainable. And that means being involved as much as you can in every part of the production, use, not just consumption, use, reuse, recycle, and reproduction cycle as you can. I'm just going to stick up for the press on this one. <laughs> um, 
I think that a lot of the narrative about sustainability in sign making and display production has all been about the quality of the material. What's it made from? Can we recycle it? Instead, we need to think about purpose. Is this sign permanent or is it going to be changed regularly? And if it's not, if, and so, for example, five years ago, the reason why we were in the press was talking so much about sustainability, I think, and I'm sorry to keep going back to wide format print. We'll keep it more on sign making for the rest of the session if we can. But, um, you know, remember that, that, that we're getting a lot of this information from suppliers, and what they want us to do is to print more onto more media, because that's how, they, how, how these guys make money, right? So they're talking about the sustainability of their products, but not the sustainability of the purpose of the sign. Okay? And I think this is really important, and I think this is somewhere where digital signage can create an impact. As Juan said, a digital sign can have a, fir a primary, a secondary, and a tertiary purpose. So it, it, it has a, a better chance of you know, fulfilling a purpose all the way through its life cycle. Um, whereas you know, we used to see a solvent print that was then laminated, so it has a theoretical durability of seven years out of home or something like that, and then it's only used for three months, and then it's thrown away. You know, so they, I think we really need to think about purpose. I'd like to come back to a, to a very traditional sign-making application, and I think that this is an area which really um, gives us a great example of um, where emerging technologies, digital signage, wearable technology, the Internet of Things, smart cities, can all really have an impact, and that's wayfinding. Wayfinding and information design are one of the most important uh, elements of our, of our lives. We may not realize it, but the way that cities are planned and the way that technology is deployed is to make us move around areas and to help us understand where we're going. Now, um, obviously, Print is used for, for wayfinding, but um, you know, going back to the sustainability argument just briefly, and Sonia, I wonder what you think about this. Um, E-ink technology, like the technology in your Kindle. Now, more and more in new buildings especially, we're seeing um, Kindle-type technologies, whether they're monochrome or in color, being used, say, to tell you who's in a meeting room. All of a sudden, you can link all of those signs up and you can change them dynamically. Now, sometimes we don't need a big, bright, full-color screen, do we? Um, but then also, you don't have to have these little, you know, the engraved pieces of plastic um, that are being shoved in manually. Um, Sonia, do you think that e-ink and Kindle-type technology is, gonna, is going to help us um, you know, change the way that we, that we move around, the way that wayfinding happens? Well, I think it will um, um, depend on two things. How um, cheap this e-ink um, um, e technology is going to become, because the problem is once you are in a not very controlled area, um, you might find yourself replacing this kind of things quite frequently, uh, at least in the beginning, because people will just try to keep them. So if you end up with like a huge budget for um, um, always um, having to deploy new um, e-ink displays, you will become not very happy. The other thing is um, I personally have the problem that I think um, if you're looking for a way sign, you want it to be big and bright and you want to, to, to see it at, um, 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 in, on the outdoors at least um, at any minute. So um, like a black and white technology is maybe not the ideal thing to do. But as you were talking about those indo indoor signs, for example, um, um, for office buildings and stuff like that, that's just perfect. That's what I think. Juan, I'd like to, to pick up with you on, um, on that point. We, I mean, obviously, we've got indoor wayfinding and we've got outdoor wayfinding, okay? Now, um, exterior wayfinding, obviously, that we could do something intelligent by using screens, by using wearables, but it's the old question with digital signage. What happens if there's a power cut? So aren't we still going to rely on static signage as well as, you know, everyone wandering around looking at their phone and not where they're going? Well, first we already have some kind of wayfinding application on, uh, on digital signage on public uh, highways. This uh, dynamic uh, speed limit indicators and traffic diversion uh, are all connected to some kind of Internet of Things for measuring traffic and, and traffic jams. And more or less, they are human assisted, but um, automatically managed. And as long as you say, Power is not the real issue. I mean, if there is no power, you don't need science, any kind of science, because you have another issues. 
And uh, yeah, and and if you plan a public utility, power is already in the in the in the mix. You have backups. For how long? Mm, as long as someone is still the backup. But uh, you have backups for at least half a journey. So it's not not it's not a matter of if if if, it's, if you need print a sign or not. It's uh, it's a matter of is it's useful or not, because you you need to try not to over-engineer in ev everything. Most of the times, the digital solution is just cool, but it's not really needed. And the other way, too, sometimes you s still insist on printed when there is not, not a real need for printing. I think this, the, you, you're touching there on a very important point as well. Um, you know, we, we tend to say, oh, you know, younger people, they're not engaged with signage, they're not engaged with printing. Um, is it not true, Sebastian, that we're just sick of advertising? You know, we've got, I, I remember the first time I went to Times Square in New York, and you've got some of the biggest, brightest signs in the world. It's just too much, isn't it? And, so, and are we not just overloading everyone with information? Isn't it better maybe just to have more static and less moving pictures trying to get our attention all the time? It's complex because I think it's a love-hate situation. We all embrace advertising. We like good advertisements. And we even reward the best advertisements and say, oh, this is great. And there are great brands that we love. And on the other side, we're sick of seeing it all over the place. And I think now, with internet, with new technologies, we've become difficult. And we want quality advertisement. And we want marketing that's intelligent and not just stupid, saying, oh, this product's great and it's cheap and et cetera. So now with all these technologies and the experts that discuss it here, it's how to make advertising intelligent and new and bold and creative and different because we're just stick at the, at the TV advertisements that are boring between uh, when we're watching CSI and then we're just going to change the channel. But if the advertisement's interesting, done by good people that know how to animate content, then we're going to watch it. And sometimes we're going to watch TV shows that are just about advertisements and the great advertisements that we see in Japan with uh, well-known actors or or we're going to look and look at how many times we have advertisement related or marketing related things in our mailbox that friends send us and say, oh, this is funny, this is great, and you send it to other people. Or that you see advertisements in um, video clips. So today, advertisement means a lot of things, but it also has to do with quality of the content. Sonia, do you agree with that? Do you think that we need to, that it's the quality that's the issue when we're talking about um, all these new devices and these new ways of communicating with people? Do you think, um, do you think we need to have fewer, but with better content? What, what's, your, what's your idea? Well, again, I think it depends. It depends on the um, um, target audience you have, you know? Um, if you're, for example, walking by a McDonald's and you're a 14-year-old girl, you, uh, you might be really interested in getting an SMS or w whatever, a beacon, whatever advertising on your mobile phone or even on an, on an outdoor screen saying, hey, you, you just won like a cheaper hamburger or something. Well, when I walked by a, a, a McDonald's, I was like, even if you give it to me for free, I'm, I'm not into that kind of things, you know? So uh, it has nothing to do with McDonald's. You can ex exchange Vapiano or any other restaurant um, um, for that. If I just don't feel something like that, then I'm just not the target audience or not the target audience on that day. So a certain amount of annoying can't be um, avoided, I guess. And, and so I think we're in the long run, we will not embrace advertising any more than we already do um, because quite a lot of people understand that, for example, using all the Google services for free requires um, ads for re refinancing. Um, this, the funny or the um, really interesting part will be when everyone um, um, decides that he's fed up with advertising, how, um, no matter how targeted, um, how do we finance that kind of services that we have grown to love, uh, but no one wants to pay for then? But as I said, I don't think that you will have a non-annoying um, advertising anytime soon because even an advertising that I like one day, I might just hate on another day, and there is no no way in measuring that, you know. So.
It's difficult, isn't it? Because we have the opportunity to reach more people and we have the opportunity to be more specific about who we reach. But then how, you know, that's going to rely on um, mobile interactivity, NFC, beacons to deliver messages to people, as well as, of course, audience measurement technology. So, you know, we, we're seeing um, a number of solutions coming out where you've got a camera in the top of the sign that can now detect whether you're male, female, how old you are, and therefore serve an appropriate advert. But, um, I mean, Juan, how do you think that um, people in the public react to that kind of thing? You know, do they, it's the old minority report question, isn't it? Is it great or is it spooky? If done in a right way, people would not realize. I mean, it's like, uh, have you said before, uh, it's not a matter of visual overloading. The real issue is when there, there's multi-sensory overloading, like sent in places, and you move to place to, uh, to, from place to place, and every, every theme, every advertising is also sound, visual, and, and sent. And this is very confusing and can easily overload you. And in terms of uh, people tracking, behavior tracking, um, wearable, mobile, or just um, active on the place, if don't, in the right way, people will not realize that they are tracked and the content they are seeing is just uh, suited for them. The issue starts when you abuse or don't make it on a smooth way. It can be a bit rush, a bit growth. I mean, uh, and we are going to see more and more bad examples because what we are seeing now are mostly. Uh, technology showcases and they are very very careful about why, uh, how they are making it and what they are showing when this uh, spreads a bit and I mean the, the technology uh, facilitators are really around and not are not particularly expensive we are going to see a lot of uh, of this kind of applications you you will start to see really bad applications and very intrusive ones too yeah sure Sebastian no, just an idea to talk about the intrusive side of it, and it's in my own personal opinion. I think that we've meet, we've reached the summit of the interactivity cycle. If you look at some of the tendencies, Facebook is going down in Europe and in America as people are leaving it, they're bored with it. We get too many emails from shops that are sending us stuff that's one-to-one, -one, so at the end of the day, it's just spam for us. We're take, getting rid of it. When we get an, an advertising SMS on our phone, we're like, ah get rid of it so I was maybe there's a question about are we just sick of all this interactivity in the social media and the one-to-one -one? and as you said isn't technology meant to embrace the experience of something where there's signage where you go to the movie theater and there's digital signage selling us popcorn but we also get the smell and the look and that's advertising too and not just the emailing and the and the SMS in my telephone saying oh please eat popcorn I'm almost tired of that, and it's a tendency that we see. Yeah, but, you know, it's always about a transaction, but it's a both ways transaction. It's a bidirectional one. Uh, what, used to be, what used to be marketing is uh, mass customization. It's one message for everyone and just collect the cash. One-on-one uh, -on -one is really one-on-one. -on -one. It's extremely, extremely hard work because you need to speak personally with everyone as much as you can. And if you don't do that, it will not work and people will not get what they are expecting because people are, uh, people are engaging with you because you give them what they want and not what you want. If you are lucky, they are aligned and you make cash on, the, on top. But it's not what they, their business model is not your business model. And if you don't suit their business model, they will live. Happen, ha happen around all the time, every time, every engaging platform, because social network is not just one, uh, one place. Uh, uh, the places are platforms. Every platform has its time, and when they start to extremely monetize without serving their users' purposes and their users' needs, people just go to the next one. Happen all around bad in soccer, bad in football, because football still give people what they want. But once they start to not serve in people proposals and start being a business, probably they will move to monster tracks or other kind of sports. 
That's, that's a very interesting point. Um, and I'd like to say that alongside this, um, this personalization of data um, and the increase in the amount of information that we have and that we need to store to make that possible, um, at the same time, we are building the basic blocks of our cities and our lives very differently. New houses and new major buildings in cities now, you know, I mean, I remember, uh, you know, seeing a house tw um, 15 years ago that already had Ethernet cables running around it, and I thought that was fantastic. You know, now uh, we've, we're going to have all sorts of technology integrated into our buildings. Um, and um, so that's going to incorporate two things. We're talking about smart cities, where, for example, um, you know, uh, there's a big project um, that IBM has been doing for the last four years in South America, um, where they use intelligent wayfinding to change the traffic flow around the city. Um, then um, we're also talking about the Internet of Things, where most of the devices that are electronic in our daily life will have a tiny computer in them that will essentially enable them to be networked. Now, um, Sonia, what kind of impact do you think that, um, that this will have over the next five, ten years? Um, and isn't that going to be really confusing for the little sign maker? And she's, you know, she's there in her shop, and she maybe has a few people working for her and thinking, hold on, are we even going to have signs on the front of the building anymore? Well, I'm not sure if we don't need um, um, signs on front of buildings because um, I guess, like, for example, big corporations, they will always want to make the point. So we are IBM or, I don't know, we are HP or we are whatever. Um, so, and this is our house. So, like, everyone still has, um, um, like, um, his own name sign on, on his own uh, flat or on, on, on his house. Um, I mean, most of the people know who they want to visit, you know. So um, technically, we wouldn't really need a name sign on the mo on, on the most flats, but still they are in existence um, 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 these days. Um, when it comes to intelligent cities, I mean, most of the uh, um, sign printers, they actually, they don't do traffic signs or things like that. Um, so I don't think that it will Im impact their business as much as you would think of. Um, but the thing is, if, for example, uh, wayfinding changes with the days or um, even with, with the hours uh, to make sure that people distribute evenly, it will be a huge impact on the advertising industry and then by proxy to the sign maker. Because obviously now you can sell advertising space and you can say like, I don't know the English word for that. In German, we say Tausender contact price, which means like this is a place where really a lot of people walk by so you can charge more money. Um, because like you have measured the, the, uh, the traffic that was there and you came to the conclusion that a lot of people walk by and they, they watch that particular space. But if in an intelligent city this might change from um, um, hour to hour, um, then you will at least have to um, um, make that, that new, you have to make new measurements and you will find out that maybe um, for example, um, the hamburger has to be advertised at a place where usually a lot of people drive by in the afternoon. Um, it will change the whole advertising industry, not just the printing industry, I think. Juan, do you think we're going to have a difference in this, in this future interconnected world between the purely practical signs and then the advertising, the, 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 the sales mechanism? There is something that is already affecting um, a particular application on outdoor advertising display, which is fleet decoration for non-public transport. I mean, this fleet decoration that you might apply to delivery. Delivery is heavily and will be heavily affected by, by, by city planning and by smart city planning. And uh, if, you, um, if you do um, fleet decoration for for brand or for advertising on delivered fleets, this will heavily affect the impact and the effectivity of your advertising in this particular, and also in public transport. But public transport is easy to manage because it has a, a definite pattern of, of transport, definite places where, where they go, and, and you can mostly forecast uh, which people is going to be uh, impacted with this advertising. But in fleet, in, in delivery fleets, which delivery fleets are going to be huge in the next future, both managed and unmanaged, 
this will have a huge impact in this kind of, of outdoor advertising. And Sebastian, when you look five, ten years into the future, what do you, what do you think the significant technologies are going to be um, alongside the interconnected world that we're going to live in? It's hard to say. I think we're still in the learning curve and every FESPA is different. And um, I'm curious to see where 3D printing is going because it was sold to us as everybody's going to have a small 3D printer in his home. And there's not many applications for it besides if you want to print out something, a souvenir or a small icon or whatever. Uh, it's interesting to see here what 3D is going to do in signage which applications that'll be there and how that's going to mix with all the other stuff. And I think that we've reached a point where all the machines are as fast and as better and as strong as they've ever, they've ever been. So now it's all about applications and new markets that are using our technologies for something different, like textile, like industrial. So, but it's interesting to, to, to see it changing, but in five years, it might even change next year. It's a fast moving industry. I would just add to that to say that I think one of the um, one of the best areas for a sign maker, and I'm really thinking about about a classic um, sign and display producer that maybe ha maybe might run a couple of printers, but maybe not. Um, I think that display systems are really really important. If you can look at display systems that not only hold a static print but also can hold a digital sign, then that's going to be a very interesting area for you to be able to get into. And I would also consider near field communication and beacon technology alongside that, because obviously that's more likely to be integrated within the thing holding the sign rather than the sign itself in many cases. So I think that, um, I, I mean, we're going to go over to, the, to ask um, if anyone's got any questions in a second, but I think it's about looking, as Sebastian said, um, I think it's not just about, um, you know, there, is, there are a lot of very crazy, very disruptive technologies out there in sign and display at the moment, but obviously we just don't quite know how it's all going to evolve yet. So hang tight, stay positive, and um, keep coming to great panels and reading the trade press because um, sometimes we get it wrong, but uh, not, not always. Does anybody out there have any questions uh, for, for us? Go on. Someone, someone wants to know something. Do any of you have any questions or anything else you'd like to, to bring up? OK. Um, in which case, thank you very much to Juan, to Sonia, to Sebastian for being on my panel today. You can find them all on Twitter, Juan Diaz Diaz on Twitter. Sonia is large format DE, um, and Sebastian is at Caldera Rip. And I am the Mohawk Man. This has been the Sign Hub. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>